Well, the Nigeria Union of Local Government Employees has appealed to President Tinubu to intervene in an alleged abuse of powers by state governors. This, along with recent developments in local government administration in Ogun State, has rekindled the clamor for the enforcement of local government autonomy in Nigeria. Rise News correspondent Wenga Ashuru has more on this. Like a wild goose chase, the clamor for the enforcement of local government autonomy has failed to yield the much-needed results. The last administration had tried by way of directing direct remittance from the Federation account to the local governments. Yes, that has happened, but what happens? It is back-cycled. They are given directive from the state to actually recycle those funds. The crucial role of the local government arm in bringing the impact of democratic governance to the grassroots can't be overstated. But like a persistent virus, the state governors had stood in the way of the local government access to funds, thereby making councils ineffective. State governors engaged in the legal dissolution of elected council officials and appointment of caretaker committees or sole administrators. Repeatedly, the courts, particularly the Supreme Court, declare such conduct illegal. After a brief respite from the long-drawn agitation between the local governments and state governments, recently, both parties got back to the trenches as the local government chairman of Ijebu East filed a petition to the anti-corruption agencies on account of diversion of funds against the Ogun State Governor, prompting the National Union of Local Government Employees to appeal to President Tinumbu for urgent intervention. If this trending social media video is anything to go by, it further adds credence to the compromised situation the local government chairman have found themselves a far cry from autonomy. Whose time? The reforms that are happening at INEC in order to ensure that one man, one board counts will also have some positive effect on the local government. According to section 162, subsection 6, each state shall maintain a special account to be called state joint local government accounts, into which shall be paid all allocations to the local government councils of the state from the federation account and from the government of the state. I think what has happened is that the same local government functionaries which they put in place are still the same functionaries that they used to divide this fund from developmental purposes. So what the governor then resorted to is to say we cannot appoint caretaker committees, we'll find a way out. They then resorted to manipulation of local government elections. Hence, in all the states of the Federation, the ruling party in a state must win all the chairmanship and councillorship elections so that at the end of the month, nobody will question the governor. While the law does not give powers to the state governors to touch the local government funds, the law, it appears, does not restrain the governors from doing so as evident in the numerous cases of alleged diversion of local government funds by state governors. So the reality is that the local government chairman go cap in hand to the state governors for funds from the joint accounts. The intervening force of the National Assembly has failed to change the system as amending the laws requires two-third consenting votes of the state assemblies. There is abuse of power in the running of that place, in the running of local government administration in, in Nigeria, particularly from the superintendents of state governments. They just need to be disciplined. They need to be a moral obligation on the part of state governors to allow development to thrive at the grassroots. Likewise, the introduction of executive order by the Buhari administration to ensure funds meant for local governments are paid directly to them using the National Financial Intelligence Unit's was struck out by the court. In the legislative agendas, always have this issue of local government autonomy as a priority you know, uh, area of uh, legislative inputs. 
But sadly, you know, for political reasons, the parliament most times meets, you know, these challenges at the level of, uh, you know, um, the state's level. As the dilemma persists, with local governments at the receiving end, leaving a yawning gap at the level of grassroots developments, the way forward seems to appeal to the moral conscience of the governors as a restraint on the much alluring local government funds for the preservation of the nation's democracy and long search for good governance. The London Party Club refund for local governments, cornered by state government, apart from Delta State, will have to be paid into the state, I mean, into the local governments. In some of the states, more than five billion was stolen. In some, over two, three billion was stolen. So those governors will have to account for the money. Secondly, Nigerians must insist that Section 7 of the Constitution and several decisions of our court on the autonomy of local government be respected. And finally, the Accountant General of the Federation must resume the monthly publication of the statutory allocations of the three tiers of government. It is basically a moral issue now because the people at the grassroots are suffering. And when the government closest to them, which is the local government, is not functioning, then this is where we continue to have, you know, uh, issue of poor governance. To cross this hurdle, all stakeholders and gatekeepers would need to consent to a constitutional amendment for local government autonomy and accountability to become a reality. Benga Ashiru, Arise News. Well, thanks, Zach. Benga Ashiru. Well, for more on this, I'm joined in the studio by Professor Udenta Udenta. He's a political strategist and the founding national secretary of the Alliance for Democracy. Good to see you and thanks for your time. It's a pleasure, Sloba, to be with you. Well, I, I really wish that uh, the kind of smiles we have on our faces now will also, you know, get to those people at the grassroots. But again, uh, you know, a lot of people will ask how we got here. Time was, uh, I said to someone, uh, for a lot of us, we recall the drama series of Village Headmaster. Yeah, One of the sure. most important cast there mm. was Councillor Balogun. A grassroots personality but somehow we have lost it and uh, there seemed to be a disappearance of grassroots governance in Nigeria today yeah so uh, how do we unpack some of these issues you know part of what you've uh, put out here and part of what was presented during the very long uh, you know media recap of yeah. the situation my first take is that there is this tremendous of reliance on the text of the Constitution as a guide to governance and impact of governance on the land. Over reliance. Yes, over reliance. Britain has no written constitution, you know, tradition, convention, you know, norms, and so on, precepts, information times, and then parliamentary decisions over certain matter. Yet it's coherent and cohesive. They run their system. In 1970, shortly after the Civil War in East, East Central State, Obadi Aseka, who didn't enjoy the massive support of the people because of this rule they said they played in the Civil War, was the administrator. But for the five years before the code data of 75, that was the golden age of local government administration. What did this government do? Government did not, in a paternalistic manner, hand down to the people at the grassroots what development should, part they should, should pursue. What happened was that the local government authorities would visit every autonomous community and said, how many kindreds do you have in this community? 30. Then you do proper election at the kindred level to elect a councillor. Then at the collegiate level, you let a chairman of the council, of the, of the council. My father was the chairman of the council. Then you decide what you want as development. Then you match it with local contribution. Then you take it to the local council, and they don't match what they have. So the government will decide that you want school, but you want hospital. Hospital goes. They may decide you want COVID, but you want bridge, or you want market. So it is the, the grassroots driven excess of development that mattered. And that transformed my community, as well as other communities across this eastern region, as the golden age. There was no constitution. There was no parliament. But there was governance that appealed to the people. Even the wife of the administrator, you know, Chinya Rukwabi Asako, started what she called Utuolo Bodo, means community work. And women embraced it and empowered gender in the 70s. That's 50 odd years. 
Today we're still struggling with gender equality and so on and so forth. That's number one. That means the constitutional text is important, but there should be a fetishization of text of the constitution. We should rather find ways where citizens driven, empowered species can begin to weigh in at the local level, state level, and the federal level in order to get things done properly and the constitution specified. Finally, the experience of the Arab Spring has taught us, not just at the local government level, there were constitutions in those countries, there were parliaments, they were in a sense democratic in nature. But democracy doesn't derive legitimacy at the local, at the subnational, at the national level from constitutional text, from periodic elections. It derives from the conversation we are holding here. How far the governance model has impacted on the lives of the people. Finally, at the federal, it may not be as grave at the local, local government level. With the exception of the Saraki presidency, you know, and the you know, presidency that produced a moment of disruption, when they went against the party decision to say we're going to become senior president or speaker and not what the party decided. So we can have a parliament that is uniquely separate, independent, autonomously existing, but interconnected to the executive branch. The feature has been the same, just like you find in the States. Today you find the party and the government of the day at the presidential level dictator who becomes senior president, who becomes speaker. Even to the absurd level of the executive branch helping the parliament to choose chairman of, chairman of committees. So when they choose chairman of committees and choose the speaker and the senate president, then the presidential you know, budgetary provision in terms of the text of the budget, which is actually a draft, becomes law. The parliament goes cap in hand. What do you want here? What do you want here? We'll protect everything, then add our own. So be it. What is the story? That's one aspect of it. So it is as it's terrible at that level, maybe not as terrible as the level of the local government, but it's not always here at the federal level. And an anecdote from Benue State is instructive here. It's like an urban legend, but there's some truth in this anecdote. Some village chiefs met the chairman of a local council and said, we know you receive two kinds of money every month. The money from Abuja, which doesn't belong to us. But the money you raise from us, taxes and rates and revenues from women, from farmers, from produce buyers, you must account for every penny of that money. But the one you get from Abuja, the so-called federal location, you go there and they give it to you, it's your own. So there's a disconnect in the mentality of the people from their own wealth. So the way they know is the wealth that comes from their pocket. The moment they embrace the totality of their wealth and decide that this local government chairman and this councillors must perform to the dictate of the people, things will improve. You know, because the only time we hear politicians say or speak something close to the truth is when they say politics is local. The politics is local. Good, and, and it is. A, a good thing you have actually taken us back to the 70s. You can imagine if the women were that organized from the grassroots at Absolutely. that time, 50 years, ago, yes, 50 years ago, and counting. So at what point did we mi miss it? Well, let me put it this way. In my own part of the world, which is the southeast, Igbo land, from Abiafra, in 75, there was a coup in the tower that brought, you know, Motala Mohammed. Then there was a counter coup. There was a coup again, that uh, aspiring coup from Leba Dinka that took him down. And then Abbasanjo became, you know, the head of state. With that was introduction of, of course, you know, local state governors in East Central State called, what it was called, Atom Bera. Atom Bera, what did he do? He with the chair, he, he with the commissioner for local government, to Denigwe, you know, brilliant political scientist, Professor Jean Odenigwe. And then Abakopa, that was the father of Abakopa and so on, sat down together and said there must be a new constituted authority structure in the local level, in the East. That means we're not allowed autonomous communities to be driven by development unions alone. We could develop associations in concert with the council, like I described earlier, where they intersected to drive that golden age. The moment they decided that traditional rules must be imported from somewhere for every community, go and elect a chief. So chiefs were elected. And unfortunately, those Atambara chiefs never had successors. But there was no you know, ancestral grounding in terms of royalty. It's just if you have money and influence, you buy it. And when you die, some guys, some guys with some moral issues, you know, drug and all manner of things with a lot of money, came back home and seized the apparatuses of governance at that level. That corrupted the democratic impulses you find in the development union and the town you know, and the community councils. 79 again constitutionalized in that fixed model of presidential system. You know, some of this understanding, I think most like, almost like the acts and edits from the 
military era were all incorporated into the local, you know, the local administrative council of the Second Republic. That meant the dissolution of the councils, the weakening of the welfare unions, the development unions, and then the larger than life rule of the traditional authorities. Increasingly, with the local men chairman emerging, with the councillors, many were driven, you know, with the politics of acquisition, politics of transmutation of their life, politics of social and political and economic mobility, and not politics of development, which was hanging on the people from 1970 to 1975, 76, and so on. Till today, it has become codified that the local government is now a theater of the absurd. You ask yourself 24 years, odd years, of so-called return to democratic rule, and people are fleeing the local authorities in their droves, in their millions. That means there is a petrogenetic pattern of development occurring before our very eyes. The cities are becoming larger than life, and then the bigger cities are becoming megalopolis. That means Abuja, which was constructed to maybe be an administrative capital, is now hosting not just the mainstream Abuja metropolitan center, but within the suburbs and the ghettos and all the area councils, possibly seven to ten million people. So, in other words, it, it's, it, it will be right to say the local governments uh, have been deliberately, uh, you know, made handicap uh, not to. Uh, it's a cash cow, it, an easy cash cow. Because the, 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 the thing here is that we've seen attempts. Uh, President uh, Buhari did the same thing, and that's why this protest is also on uh, by these uh, council chairmen asking President Tinubu to also weigh in. At what point do you think, because now let's come back, you said over reliance on the constitution, but again the constitution seems not to be uh, what you have just said it is. A lot of people still think that we still have not been able to practice the uh, separation as it should. Uh, that is why, you can't that is why mm -hmm. the states have been able to put some of these councils in their pockets. The problem is that the kind of democratic you know, you know, practice we inherited in 1999 and some of us are complicit. I was the national secretary of a major political party. They wanted three then, you know, they said we want to get the military off our back, you know, in order to end, you know, bring to closure the issue of the June 12th and now the election. And Abdullah won it. And then Abdullah had to have a short transition. Anything we inherited post Abdullah Abubakar, you know, was what it for us. We didn't examine the text of the constitution very well. We didn't know the consequences of what we embarked upon. We didn't know the contradictions embedded in this so-called presidential form, in a formulation of a constitutional text. But we just two, but, it. But over two decades is two enough. Decades it, it, it's, actually, over, it, it, it's good enough time for us to come back and, and rejig, retreat. The, the point is that the moment closure occurs, that means you elect people on the basis of the constitution. Interest will not pervade this, the social and political space. You mentioned that in the, in the, in the narrative. For you to secure the two thirds support of the state assemblies. The last absurd one occurred in Imo State, if I'm not mistaken, there's their amendment at the federal level, at the NAS, National Assembly, to say, we want to give you autonomy. State legislatures are voting against autonomy for themselves because they're watching the behavior of the governors. Most governors have medievalized power, what they call the medievalization of power at the state level. That means you don't have any tissues of democratic governance. You don't have you know, checks and balances. You don't have people pushing back on authoritarian and liberal mindset of most of these you know, mobile level disorganizers of power at the subnational level. Not all the government, but some. So when state assembly members vote against their own interests, against document autonomy, against autonomy of the state assembly, then something is wrong with the system, the way it is constituted. Then, then, then why do you it think that? About is, it, 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 looks, it looks, uh, sorry to cut you, it looks like it is because uh, they're not actually the people's uh, representatives. It's not even a question of people's representatives. It's actually the mindset of the people who send them forth to represent them. When you decide that those people send forth are not servants of the people, but lots to the people, when you believe that poverty is haunting the land and people are disempowered and completely disillusioned, so anything that drops from the councillors and the chairmen and the state assembly members and so on there could be a matter of life and death for them. That means how am I going to push back against a councillor who is dropping little things from me every now and then? You know, I come to his house or her house and then somebody to change into my pocket. I cannot be in this that strong, empowered position to push back on seeing a guy who never had a home, suddenly is building a mansion, who never had a bicycle, now he has two or three cars. The money you, to purchase all these like, pertinences of democratic governance are the money, the, the money belonging to the people. So my take is that the model of democracy we have, there must have to be a disruptive moment in which you have to investigate and interrogate it. The presidential system may be something that has endured for 24 years, but why are our scholars silent about it? What are intellectuals? Why have they abdicated the responsibility of thinking for the nation? When they abdicate thought to the political class alone, that class is mindful of its interest 
and how to protect that interest. But again, there seems to be a, you know, a continuation of the old you know, corrupt order, uh, irrespective of generation. And that is why we really need to uh, interrogate and find out what exactly is wrong. Time was when people would have thought that it's uh, related to a particular generation or particular order. For instance, you talk about the First Republic, you talk about Second Republic, all the republics. But today we have younger persons, younger Nigerians that have even done worse things uh, than what we saw in times past. So there must be something about the kind of culture that we have you know, imbibed over the years uh, to making us think that grassroots governance isn't what it should be. Beyond, beyond culture, Good. there is a new thesis I've been pursuing for the past one year. I call it a sense of ritual escalation, which means the maladies that afflict the nation and the kind of therapeutics required to address those maladies. In a tremendous hour of God, where I took my bearing from that ritual moment to say, every community will suffer diseases. But you look for the animal whose blood will match the potency of that disease. That's why in ritual ceremonies, you find a fowl, you kill it, or a ram, or a bull. In ancient past, they can even kill a human. It is how do you locate the problem and how do you find a particular solution? That's what we're missing in this democracy. A lot of people have the mindset that we fought the military. People like us suffered detention five, six times, some went into exile. So we fought the military in this particular format. So when the new government is in place and it is not liberal in nature, what it is a civilian government, we must fight it using the same tools. So fighting the civilian regime with the tools of the, against the military will not work. That's why it is not working. Every time there's this pattern and it is very clear and it's very, very obvious mm -hmm. what steps to take. We have to become more adaptive in the way and manner we struggle to fight or push back against the orders of the day. For example, c civic unions and the CBOs, you know, community-based organizations, youth colleagues at the local level must find a way to task their legislators, but the councillors, state assembly members, members of the federal parliament, they have constituency offices. They have the way to raise the banner of struggle at that level to say, we sent you to Abuja, we sent you to Enugu, we sent you to Paracot, we sent you to the state capital to do this for us. The councillor, you live among our, our, you know, within us, in the kindred. If you don't do what we expect, we ostracize you. We set you apart from the rest of the people because you are not doing what you want us to do. Everybody's looking at Abuja, the power center of the federation where the money resides. So you forget the state and the local government. So the people, they are sitting pretty and empowering themselves and dismiss for the people. So the people must focus back at home. That's why I said that the logic of intervention and struggle must escape that mindset of fighting the military with a particular model of struggle to a new adaptative, more creative model that disrupts the ability of the political class to keep on pushing the people down. How hopeful are you that this just might be reversed, that we might get it right? We could get it right when, apart from, as I said, over reliance on the constitutional text, you know, it's a, good, it's a great problem. You know, you talk about moral passion, you talk about the authority, moral authority that comes with leaders. You talk about, uh, you know, people, you know, who occupy or inhabit empowered civic spaces through training, through education, through deep knowledge, through interconnectivity, and through struggle. They could basically say, enough is enough. We're going to use pamphlet, leafleting, spreading the message, talking to people, raising awareness about what you're doing. It is risky, it is cumbersome, but democratic struggle is not a day struggle. It's a struggle of a lifetime. Now that reminds me, you just spoke about a, a book you wrote and uh, you're talking about pamphlets. Uh, you turn 60 soon and uh, we understand that you also have about 21 books so far. There are 21 <laughs> books. Now I can break them down for you. I'm going to turn 20 and 60 on 5th September, next Tuesday. And these 21 books will be delivered that day in one location in Abuja at NAV Conference Center in Kado. So, now, okay. these books deal with philosophy, aesthetics, politics, literature, peaks, you know, you know, you know, you know conflict resolution. It deals with creative literature, poems, novels, short stories, all tissues of life and existence that appear to me from the time I was a little boy to the stage in which today to, I'm going to turn 60. So it is an offering for Nigerian people, it is not just my own personal creation. I believe that a scholar and intellectual has a duty to spread knowledge and for people to participate in that art of sharing that knowledge. Again, it's going to be a conference on how to make Nigeria work. That means I'm not celebrating anything there to please myself or empower my soul with food or drinks, but how do you offer to the people of this country opportunity to penetrate your mind and see whether that mind can intersect between what we call intellectual and praxis, 
the intellectual production of a scholar and the practical involvement in the social, political, cultural, and ideological struggles of the day. That I defined my life in the past 30, 40 years. So the combination of that struggle to balance you know, intellect and balance it with struggle and practice is what led to these 21 books that culminate in the celebration of a city birthday. You know, a while ago you, you mentioned Arrow of God. And we'll still talk about these great giants. And uh, here you are. To, yes, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. great Trinity Great giants. Can, so, you know, um, how much of learning, uh, you know, uh, have we been able to get from some of these texts uh, that have helped our growth as a people? The problem is that people, and I'm happy this culture didn't even start from here. In the past, Things for the Part wasn't studied as a literature text, as a sociological text. In European and American universities, go and investigate. So they believe that his acuteness of imagination was so coherent and legitimate that you can use a creative fiction to study the culture of a people, their mode of governance, their rituals, the art of their belief system, their cosmology. So this part disrupted a whole lot of things. It disrupted the way aesthetic productions occur. I want us to talk about that, the aesthetics, uh, the uh, revolution. Okay, this one is Rebliss in Youthhood, and then we have to use Scribblings. No, no, there was one before this. Okay, so if, if we this I wrote when I was 13 years. While you were 13? 13. 13. Six of the volumes were written between 13 and 14 years. There are 17 texts I did then. So this I'm is about aesthetics. This. Revolutionary aesthetics. This is actually domestication of Marxist you know, aesthetic philosophy into the Nigerian African you know, you know, cultural and aesthetic space. What did I do? I said, the main drive of African literary and cultural development, and by extension, political evolution, has to be contestation between imperialism and between African resurgence. That means Pan Africanist origin for decolonization, now we call decoloniality, can only occur when we mobilize the agency of Marxist dialectics in helping us can, to can come we, out of Can this we place. link that to grassroots governance and what's happening in Gabon and Niger? The way I can link it up there is that. The model I chose is a model in which democratization is not just a rhetorical device, or there is a constitution, or we have a parliament, there is a president sitting in office, there is a governor, no. Democracy must emanate from the people. That's why I find the art, ideology, and social commitment in African poetry. To be committed in poetry, for example, is to show capacity to understand the needs of the society, the viewpoints of the people, the way a manner they expect reality to impinge on them. The way a man expects society to react to them. So the poet is the poet of the people. He's like a recanter, he's like a groy. So society can only grow when the mass of the people participate in the drama of creative productions. So literature, the kind of literary things I investigate is to how do you use these productions to mobilize the soul of the people? How do you use it to create agencies of resistance, of counter hegemonies? How do you use it to mobilize the people that the government of the day left on their own? will not do what you want them to do for you. You must take the government almost as the other, while you are the other self. You must therefore pursue government and governance to extract from the government as much as possible that the docility and quietude, and quietude will never secure for you expectations in life. This literature empowers your soul and gives you the sense of ideological clarity and direction that you must build communities, interconnect among yourself and say, Mr. Governor, Mrs. Governor, Mr. Lugumin Chairman, we the people know why we put you there and we can hold you accountable. Radical literature helps you in doing that. Cultural production that explores the space of the people in contestation against authorities will help you to achieve it. That's my passion at that level. There are some other words of my dealing with peace building. Nigeria peace and security architecture is not skewered to solve any meaningful problem. It's a post-war device to hold the nation. That means law and order is a key element in that architecture. Today, people urge for human infrastructure, human security development. If you don't build up education, if you don't build up health services, if you don't public works, if you don't empower people, today we are gripped by new threats. Boko Haram terrorists, banditry, disruptions across the country, pipeline vandalization, and possible collapse of democratic governance in the post colonies of West Africa and Central Africa. These are all consequences of not being alert to the needs of society. So governance is where you secure legitimacy, not through constitutional text. You have constitutional text and government and election periodically done, but without impacting on the life of the people, you lose legitimacy. And when you lose it, people can become urging. They can urge themselves to seek for self-help. Sometimes that self-help undermines democratic governance, as you find in Burkina Faso, you find in Mali, you find in Niger, Gabon recently. It's a sign and a signal, not to win the big stick alone, 
Yeah. But to ask the question, leaders are asking, Peter B. Atiku and the rest of them are asking these questions. What has gone wrong with governance in Africa? Some of these works I've done can help you to clarify the answer to that problem. Because we all certainly need an answer to that. I'd like to thank you for your time, and I do hope that we'll have more conversations. 21 books at 60, all from Professor Udenta Udenta. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And happy birthday. Thank you.